Dr. David Westaway is a molecular biologist and internationally acclaimed researcher who completed his postdoctoral training at the University of California with Nobel laureates Harold Varmus and Stanley Prusiner. Currently, he's director of the Alberta Center for Prions and Protein Folding Diseases, and his research has paved the way for new insights on Alzheimer's disease. Hi, Dr. Westaway. How are you doing today? Pretty good, thanks, Paul. Great. Um, well, thank you very much for agreeing to agree on our Benefuse.com podcast today. Um, we're actually in Dr. Westaway's uh, research laboratory, um, where they do um, extensive research on prion diseases and um, other very interesting molecular uh, biological experiments. Um, so, as you know, the topic of our discussion today uh, will be Alzheimer's disease. And now, um, as you all know, uh, sort of uh, people tend to have some degree of memory loss um, as they age. And so I guess I'd like to start out by asking you sort of generally, what is Alzheimer's disease and so how, how does it sort of differentiate from normal memory loss? Well, I think, I think we all have moments where we forget where we uh, put the car keys and that type of thing. But Alzheimer's disease is just the short-term memory loss gets um, quite profound and we just can't retain memories of things that happened only a few a few minutes ago. So it, it's, it's a little bit different from a, a sort of general absence, uh, absent-mindedness. Okay. Now, um, I also hear the term uh, dementia used quite a bit. Now, um, sort of, is Alzheimer's disease the same thing as dementia, or? Well, Alzheimer's disease, people will eventually become demented, but it's not the only type of dementia that's encountered by clinicians. It may, it may be perhaps the most common dementia, but it's not the only type of dementia. Okay, so it kind of falls under the umbrella of uh, dementia, but there, there are other diseases out there that um, can also give you memory loss. Uh, yeah, uh, but, uh, well, uh, the memory loss is something that's uh, quite special in Alzheimer's disease. I mean, when people get demented uh, uh, later on in the disease course, I mean, that they're just the um, regular rational thinking is not so is not, is not operating. Okay. So there are other diseases where Just to get an idea of the scope um, of the problem uh, here in Canada, you know, approximately how many people are currently suffering with Alzheimer's disease? Well, the rest of us is, is at least 300,000 uh, Canadians with Alzheimer's disease. So at the moment, it's around about, um, say, the one percent mark. But it's it's a, it's um, it's a disease that um, is uh, gets more frequent the oh. older the population gets. So that that number is anticipated to rise with, with the general drain of the uh, population. Okay, and so, sorry, is there kind of like a general age group at which Alzheimer's would start to rise? Would it be 55 or 65? Or? Well, it might typically be happening in 60 year olds and 70 year olds, and the incidence um, keeps going up the older you get. Unfortunately, the older you get, the bigger your chance of getting Alzheimer's disease. So if you get up into your mid-80s, then you've got a 30% uh, chance of getting Alzheimer's disease. Okay, interesting. So now sort of to the actual uh, molecular basis or, or physical basis behind this disease, um, what sorts of changes are actually seen in the brains of uh, patients suffering with Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, there's a few um, changes to do with um, structures appearing in the brain that wouldn't normally be there. So there are special types of uh, aggregates of proteins, as it were, graphs of these proteins that you wouldn't normally see with a um, simple microscope, but they accumulate in Alzheimer's disease, and there's structures called uh, uh, amyloid plaques that bear Alzheimer's disease, made of a certain type of protein, and there's other structures called uh, neurofibrillary tangles that appear inside um, neurons, inside brain cells. So, uh, so those things are sort of extra components that you see in a person afflicted with Alzheimer's disease. And conversely, um, when the disease advances, there will actually be death of neurons, so people have start to lose the, they don't have the appropriate number of brain cells anymore, the numbers of the cells are getting killed and disappearing. 
Okay. Now, um, is it thought that like these extra components, such as the amyloid plaques or the neurofibrillary tangles, um, are they responsible for um, sort of the brain mass decreasing? Or well, we know from um, a number of experiments that these um, events are uh, important. They're not trivial side effects. There's something to do with uh, destroying the life of the nerve cells, but also the ability of the nerve cells to operate. Now, I mentioned that some of the structures are quite big and you can, don't need a very fancy microscope, you can see them, so they're quite large. Um, in the terms of the amyloid beta peptide, we know that the small unit that makes that large structure, we know that that small unit must be important because there are certain um, rare families which have familiar Alzheimer's disease where they have mutations in um, components of the cell that were made more of that protein. So it's very clear that that protein molecule in the brain is important. What is not quite so clear or what is debated is um, which uh, form of it. So you can imagine it building being like a little building block and then the question is, well, if you have a, a 12 building blocks together, is that very important to destroy nerve cells? When you see these big structures, they're undoubtedly made of thousands and thousands of molecules. And, and so there's a bit of a debate as to whether the sort of intermediate sized assemblies are toxic or whether the very large assemblies are toxic. And that, and that debate uh, goes back to the forwards, but probably what can be agreed on is that the raw material, the, the building block, there is something to do with having too many of them, and then they may assemble into different states that give you, um, unfortunately, different uh, biological impacts. Okay, um, so that's very interesting. So now, um, you briefly actually already um, touched on it, but um, is there sort of a genetic basis or genetic component to there is a big genetic component to uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, however, the good news is that the um, uh, events where people have a sort of pure Alzheimer's disease family, luckily those are quite rare. Scientifically, they're very important, but those are not so rare. Um, there is a um, gene uh, variation in a gene called APOE where if you have a uh, certain version of this protein, uh, you don't automatically get out some of the disease, but your chances of getting it go up quite a lot. And that's, that's quite a well-established finding. And I suppose you can look at it from the converse point of view. If you have the other version of the gene, then you are um, unprotected. Now, that, that um, APOE gene, and there are natural variations that human populations have, so that is a sort of a risk uh, factor. Okay. Um, there are other types of mutations that are rarer where it's not, where if you have the variation in the gene, like the rare variation, then you will get uh, Alzheimer's disease. So that, that's not really a risk factor, that's a causal factor. If you have the mutation, you will get the disease. And that's rare. Um, I mentioned scientific formative, but that can give you sort of early onset familiar with Alzheimer's disease. And some of those mutations are, you know, unfortunately, people can get the disease when they're very young, so they can be getting Alzheimer's disease in their 30s and 40s. Wow. It doesn't happen very often that these um, mutations from when you first um, identified at the University of Toronto, these mutations have been very informative scientifically and that's why they that's why we know that this small um, um, protein molecule so called amyloid beta peptide um, is an important part of the um, process and that's I think that's what is one of the clues to tell us to focus on this one. Okay, so the um, would you say that um, there's been a lot of research sort of somehow linking uh, some of these genetic mutations to um, sort of the uh, pathological findings which you find, such as the tangles and the plaques? Uh, yeah, so for the plaques, there's, there's um, uh, mutations um, in, in at least four genes that help to make the components of plaques, and that's very 
nice, uh, tidy story. Um, the um, other molecule we see is the tau molecule that appears in neurofibrillary tangles. And it turns out that people don't inherit mutations in that to get Alzheimer's disease, although they do in a different type of dementia called frontal temporal dementia. But we know that that molecule must be important as well from laboratory studies where if we misregulate the, um, uh, the synthesis and maturation of that protein molecule, then, then the trouble starts to you know, kill the neurons. So there is a sequence of events. Probably the molecule called amyloid beta peptide can somehow help to get the tau molecule into the wrong shape. In, uh, Proteins are part of all our cells. They're sort of like the uh, verbs in a sentence. They normally carry out the activities in our cells, and you have to, they have to be made and assembled in a correct way. They have a three-dimensional shape, and often, if these uh, molecules get into the wrong three-dimensional shape, then that's where some trouble starts. So, somehow, having more of the amyloid peptide, beta peptide, has an effect on tau. People are trying to work out exactly how those two events are connected, but it, it seems that the, um, the uh, tau protein that can appear in neurofibrillary tangles, that, is, that is also not a bystander, that is an active part of the uh, degenerative process. Okay, very interesting. Now, um, sort of, we, we mentioned that there are people who are genetically susceptible uh, to developing Alzheimer's disease, and also the elderly are uh, more commonly infected with the disease. Um, is there any other sort of subgroup of population which um, might be sort of more susceptible to developing Alzheimer's disease? Uh, not really. I don't think there's really incisive um, studies from epidemiology to highlight very high uh, risk groups. It's sort of fairly a uh, general disease uh, process and it seems to be apparent in most industrialized societies. Certainly there are some hints that some dietary influence might be, be protective, but, but uh, in terms of um, uh, well-defined people at very high risk, the only real instance of that would be these rare familiar Alzheimer's disease mutations. Okay, great. Um, and I guess now finally, um, probably what a lot of uh, people you know, affected by the disease or loved one with the disease are wondering is, what are some of the treatment options, if any, that can exist for Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, well, the treatment option that's been around for a few years and has some uh, impact is uh, what would be called the symptomatic therapy. So when um, patients get Alzheimer's disease, they lose neurons brain cells, and some of these brain cells use a neurotransmitter called uh, acetylcholine. Okay. And um, well, constantly, when, you, when these brain cells die, then there's not enough of these neurotransmitter in the brain, and then the communication between the neurons doesn't happen as well as it can do. So by sort of partial analogy to a, a treatment for Parkinson's disease, where you increase the amount of neurotransmitter, you can increase the amount of acetylcholine neurotransmitter by inhibiting the enzyme that we're going to get rid of. So well, okay. those therapies exist and they have a, a clinical use to delay the disease and the holding back. And they've been in the clinic for quite a few years. There will very likely be um, second and third generation therapies coming along with that are directed against the molecules that we know are very important in Alzheimer's disease. So um, amyloid beta peptide that accumulates in the plaques we know is a very important target and it has quite actually a complicated biology but each facet of its biology is also has a potential for you to attack. So you can stop the uh, molecule being made in the first place. That would be one route of attack. You can stop it assembling into bigger structures so the molecules don't stack up next to each other. That would be another route of attack. Or you could uh, try and uh, uh, tweak cells so they 
really don't like it and they start chopping it up. So, it, it, so the uh, molecule that assembles it being aggregates, once you've chopped it in little bits, three pieces, it can't do that. So that sort of means conceptually the types of things that people are working on. We know that the tau protein is important and that's when it um, assembles its big uh, aggregates inside nerve cells and it has a uh, sort of a chemical modification put on the side of it. So um, that seems to be important if you can stop that chemical modification being put on it, you can attenuate the disease. And if you have less of that molecule probably a chance of building up so there's a few avenues um, uh, being explored, and the main thing is that they are um, pointed at the molecules that go wrong. So they're, then hopefully they're not going to be uh, symptomatic therapies, but stopping the molecules at the root cause of the disease. Now, of course, as with any drug testing program, there's always going to be cases where basically you can get the effect you want, but the drug has too many side effects, it's not really well tolerated by old people, and there will undoubtedly be a whole load of candidate drugs that just don't make it to the bedside, but um, that is just part of the process, so it just means you have to test more on the front end, and even if you, even if you lose 95% uh, of them, there's still a few molecules survive that don't have adverse side effects or are well tolerated and do what you want then they're going to be useful and, and as with other diseases you may end up having um, you know, low dosage of one molecule that's tolerated well and that does something that you have a different type of drug that you apply at the same time in cocktail it might be that type of uh, approach but the, but the key thing that these are, are meant to be um, rational therapies directed at the causal uh, molecules and uh, uh, if you test enough of these, you there will undoubtedly be some that survive and will make their way to the other side. So I think that's, that's what the future is going to bring us. Okay, great. Um, well, Dr. Westway, um, I'd like to thank you uh, very much for this awesome. very informative um, peek into the uh, current understanding of Alzheimer's disease. It definitely sounds like a complicated disease process, and um, hopefully, we can move closer to finding some treatments and a cure for the disease. And thank you. Okay. Sure.